Good afternoon. Welcome to the Daily Office. I'm Brother Bill, and this is Evening Prayer for Sunday, January the 21st. It's the third week after the Epiphany, the third Sunday after the Epiphany, and week three in the Psalm Cycle. And welcome back. I hope you're all uh, getting back in the routine as am I after the holiday festivities. Thank you for joining me. O oh God, come to my assistance, make haste to help me. Glory to you, source of all being, eternal word and Holy Spirit, as in the beginning, so now and forever. Amen. Alleluia. Bless the Most High, my soul, and all that is within me. Bless God's holy name. Alleluia. Psalm 103, and please recite it with me. Alleluia, bless the Most High, my soul, and all that is within me, bless God's holy name. Bless the Most High, my soul, and do not forget God's blessings. Who forgives all my iniquities, who heals all my diseases, who redeems my life from destruction, and who crowns me with loving kindness and tender mercies. Who satisfies my hunger with good things, so that my youth is renewed like the eagles. You, my God, execute righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. You have made known your ways to Moses, your acts to the children of Israel. You are loving and gracious, slow to anger and full of mercy. You will not always chide, nor will you be angry forever. You have not dealt with us as we deserve nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is your mercy toward those that fear you. As far as the east is from the west, so far have you removed our transgressions from us. Like parents who take pity upon their children, so you love them that fear you. For you know of what we are made, and remember that we are dust. And as for the children of the earth, their days are like the grass. As the flowers of the field, so they flourish. And then the wind passes over, and they are gone. And that place shall know them no more. But your mercy is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear you. And your righteousness unto children's children, to such as keep your covenant, and to those that remember to do your commandments. You have prepared your throne in the heavens, and your kingdom rules over all. Bless the Most High, you angels, that excel in strength, that do God's commandments, listening to God's word. Bless the Most High, all God's hosts, you ministers of God that do God's pleasure. Bless the Most High, all God's works, in all places of God's dominion. Bless the Most High, my soul. Alleluia. Glory to you, source of all being, eternal word and Holy Spirit, as in the beginning, so now and forever. Amen. Alleluia. Alleluia. Bless the Most High, my soul, and all that is within me. Bless God's holy name. Alleluia. Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. After fourteen years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. I went in response to a revelation, and then I laid before them, though only in a private meeting with the acknowledged leaders, the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles, in order to make sure that I was not running, or had not run in vain. But even Titus, who was with me, was not compelled to be circumcised, though he was Greek. But because of false brothers and sisters secretly brought in, who slipped in to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus, so that they might enslave us, we did not submit to them even for a moment, so that the truth of the gospel might always remain with you. And from those who were supposed to be acknowledged leaders, what they actually were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Those leaders contributed nothing to me. 
On the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel for the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel for the circumcised, for he who worked through Peter, making him an apostle to the circumcised, also worked through me in sending me to the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas and John, who were acknowledged pillars, recognized the grace that had been given me, they gave to Barnabas and me the right hand of fellowship, agreeing that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. They asked only one thing, that we remember the poor, which was actually what I was eager to do. Here ends the lesson. Scholars believe that Galatians was written sometime around the year 50 of the Common Era, and that it is one of, if not the earliest, of Christian writings. And there's a lot going on in today's text. The Jesus movement has expanded out of Judah to include different cultures and customs than those of the Jerusalem Jews. And it's clear that the number of converts has begun to shift the demographics. The church is already divided by doctrinal dissension and beset by false apostles and false prophets. And Paul is part of the problem. Since his conversion, Paul has been engaged in a mission of evangelism throughout the Greco-Roman lands outside of Judah. But not everyone is convinced that Paul's ministry is valid or that he, he is even a true convert. He is known to be a persecutor of the church and has never been formally trained nor ordained. Any rational person would be and should be highly skeptical of everything about Paul. In today's lesson, Paul begins by describing his visit to Jerusalem, during which he takes part in the Apostolic Council. He meets with James, Peter, and John, who are the recognized leaders in the Christian community. Paul, quite frankly, is seeking their approval and endorsement, an ordination of sorts. But why is Paul seeking their approval now after 14 years of doing his own thing? Had Paul reached a point in his ministry where he could no longer continue? Or, as it seems to me, is this part of a bigger plan, God's plan, to organize and grow the church? Anyway, the meeting, as recounted by Paul, is a smashing success. They're satisfied that Paul's gospel message is essentially the same as that of the Jerusalem church. And they have appointed that Paul's ministry will be to the Gentiles, while Peter's will be to the Jews. The apostles have now accepted Paul, and his ministry is thus validated and unified into the greater church. The council has also decided to not burden non-Jewish converts with the requirement of circumcision or the adherence to all Jewish customs, but rather to emphasize faith in Jesus Christ as the means of salvation. Many in the early church believed that Jesus' mission was only to the Jews and that converts to Christianity must first fully convert to Judaism. Hints of this can be seen in the story of the Canaanite woman in Matthew and in other places in the written Gospels. But now it's become official that the converts are welcome and a part of God's plan, and the church is beginning to sort out what is really important. Another key point is that the Gospel message is becoming standardized. At the time of this meeting, the Gospel is still dependent upon an oral tradition recounted from person to person, subject to each individual person's memory, interpretation, and emphasis. By reviewing and approving Paul's gospel, the council is ensuring that there is a core or an essential proclamation of the faith and the beginning of Christian theology. And Paul's submission to the authority of James and of the other apostles is essential to the apostolic tradition of ordination of church ministers, which began with the ordaining of Matthias as an apostle to replace Judas Iscariot, and Stephen and the other deacons to care for the widows at the table. 
So today's reading provides us with a history lesson of the early days in church politics. It underscores the unity of the gospel. It confirms apostolic ordination. It validates Paul's apostleship. And it lays the foundation for the inclusion of converts to the Christian community without imposing Jewish customs. Discipline is beginning to take hold. New epiphanies of God the Father and God the Son are taking place. Christian theology is evolving. And the stage is being set for all that is yet to come and for the church to grow and become universal. Amen. Show us your mercy, O God, and grant us your salvation. Let your peace be clothed with righteousness, and let your saints shout for joy. In you shall we lie down in peace and sleep, for only you make us dwell in safety. Make us a righteous nation that keeps your truth, that we may glory in your judgment. Let your way be known upon the earth, your saving health among all nations. Let not the needy be always forgotten, nor the hope of the poor perish forever. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and renew a right spirit within us. for the intentions of those who've asked our prayers and for all of your intentions. Our beloved which art in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread Forgive us as we forgive others. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Alleluia, begin a new song to my God with timbrels. Sing to my God with cymbals. Alleluia. A canticle from Judith, and please recite it with me. Alleluia, begin a new song to my God with timbrels. Sing to my God with cymbals. Sing to God a new psalm, exalt God, and call upon God's name. I will sing to you a new song. You, O God, are great and glorious, wonderful in strength and invincible. Let all creatures serve you, for you spoke and they were made. You set forth your spirit, and it created them and there is none that can resist your voice. For the mountains shall be moved from their foundations with the waters. The rocks shall melt like wax at your presence, yet you are merciful to them that fear you. For all sacrifice is too little for a sweet savor to you, and all the fat is not sufficient for your burnt offering. But they that fear you are great at all times. Alleluia. Glory to you, source of all being, eternal word and Holy Spirit, as in the beginning, so now and forever. Amen. Alleluia. Alleluia, begin a new song to my God with timbrels. Sing to my God with cymbals. Alleluia. Bless Jesus, my soul, and may the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace in believing through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Alleluia.